Hello, I am Professor Sims, and this video is about hand washing, particle transmission, and epidemiology. This is the first of 10 lab sessions included in my Laboratory for Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you're currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and Moodle site for assignments and any other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include testing the efficacy of hand washing as a control measure for pathogen transmission, performing experiments illustrating microbial transmission via direct contact, modeling the scientific method, collecting and interpreting scientific data, and understanding safety and disposal procedures relating to this lab. To begin, it is important to understand the difference between normal flora and transient flora. Normal flora are microorganisms that normally live with you. Humans have, by some estimates, 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in their body. Uh, humans cannot survive without their normal flora, which are permanent residents of the body. They're usually not pathogenic, meaning they do not normally cause disease. However, normal flora can become pathogenic if they go somewhere they're not supposed to be. Uh, for example, Staphylococcus aureus is normal flora of the upper respiratory tract, but if it gets into a skin laceration and enters your bloodstream, then all of a sudden you have a staph infection. Normal flora compete with and they antagonize non-indigenous species. This is good because they can crowd out and, and, and kick the butts of pathogens that are trying to make you sick, so that's good. They live in your sweat and oil glands and your dermis and your eyes and your nose and your mouth, and your throat, even your uh, urethra, your intestinal tract. Normal flora are essential. They're essential for your intestinal health. Like you cannot live without them. You need them for intestinal health, digestion, the production of some vitamins uh, like vitamin K and B12. Some normal flora can also produce their own antibiotics, which kill non-indigenous species pathogenic species. Transient flora are different than normal flora. These guys are temporary residents of the human body. These are microorganisms that are transmitted from the environment or from another host. So unlike normal flora of the skin, which reside in the dermal layer, in the skin, your transient flora live on the outer epidermal layer. Because the epidermis is quite dry and acidic, it's difficult for transient flora to reproduce and survive there. So the transient flora are going to usually die off or get washed away, uh, especially when good hand washing technique is employed. So we're going to learn some more about that in a little bit. Transient flora may be, but are not always pathogenic. Skin is the largest organ of your body. And as long as it's intact, meaning with no lacerations or open wounds, is extremely effective as a barrier to protect against infection. Uh, regardless of whether or not a microbe is normal flora, transient flora, whether it's pathogenic or non-pathogenic, the skin can prevent entry of microbes into the bloodstream where it can be detrimental to your health. Hand washing is the most effective way to prevent the spread of nosocomial infections. Uh, these are acquired in hospitals or in healthcare facilities. Nosocomial infections, um, they affect nearly 2 million patients and cause 20,000 deaths each year. Uh, for example, in 2011, more than 720,000 hospital-acquired infections occurred in the United States, according to the CDC. About 22% of those uh, occurred at a surgical site. Cases of pneumonia were another 22%. Urinary tract infections accounted for an additional 13%. And then primary bloodstream infections was 10%, just in that year. The most frequent cause of nosocomial infection is Staphylococcus aureus, a normal flora of the upper respiratory tract. It's been estimated that approximately 30% of the human population carries Staph aureus. Which, that sounds like a lot until you compare that to 75% of hospital and healthcare workers. The really tricky thing about Staph aureus is that not only is it ubiquitous, which means it's everywhere, but it also can survive on the skin for several weeks 
before becoming pathogenic or displaying any symptoms of infection. So I want to talk about proper hand washing. This figure here shows where most people tend to miss when they are washing their hands. It is extremely important to learn the proper hand washing technique and even good hand washers can miss in between their fingers and in the little cracks and crevices in their palms here. The correct hand washing technique will be demonstrated in class, but it involves rinsing your hands first, then using antimicrobial detergent. Uh, the one we're using is going to be Hibiclens or Hibiclens. And then you lather the entirety of each hand, paying special attention to all of these little spots where most people miss. So the back of the hand, between the fingers, under your fingernails, up above your wrist, inside all of those little creases in your palm. And you want to do that lathering, just that part, for approximately 20 seconds. And if you're not sure how to estimate 20 seconds, you can sing the happy birthday song twice. That's approximately 20 seconds. And then finally, you rinse the hands again, and you want to dry with paper towels. Paper towels are cleaner than the, the air blow dryers because those are actually blowing more bacteria onto your hands. For experiment one, we're actually going to test the efficacy of your hand washing technique. So the proper technique will be demonstrated to you using a swab culture. You're going to swab your hands before you wash them and put that on a nutrient agar plate. Then you'll swab them again after you wash them and put that on a nutrient agar plate. And we will incubate that plate and we'll see what happens. We'll see what kind of bacteria are still there after you washed your hands. If they're the same bacteria that was there before, if it's something different, it's gonna be fun. For a pathogen to persist, okay? In other words, for a pathogen to keep itself alive, it must put itself in a position to be transmitted to a new host. Mechanisms of particulate, i.e. microbial transmission. What this is, is modes of transmission, okay? These include direct contact, indirect contact, droplet contact, airborne transmission, fecal-oral transmission, and vector-borne transmission. Uh, direct contact transmission is pretty self-explanatory. It's from person to person, from host to host. Indirect contact transmission usually involves a contaminated object, also known as a fomite. A fomite is an inanimate object that potentially transmits pathogens. That is indirect contact. Fomites facilitate the indirect transmission. When they come into contact with a particulate, sub subsequently come into contact with a host. Okay. Droplet contact generally refers to pathogen transmission via coughing, sneezing, breathing too close to someone, all of that kind of stuff. It's been estimated that a single sneeze can send thousands of virus particles into the air. And they send it pretty far, too. But for something to be considered airborne, it needs to be transmittable in the air further than one meter. So that's about three feet. So this is not the same as somebody coughing, like coughing in your face. It has to be able to travel over a distance and survive over that distance for some time in order for it to be considered airborne. Fecal oral transmission is just as gross as it sounds. Um, these are the waterborne pathogens that are shed in feces, and then they're ingested by a contaminated water supply. There's a very good video that I put in the description of this video. Uh, explaining how cholera is transmitted and how it's an example of fecal oral transmission. And then, of course, you have vector borne transmission. So these are uh, animals that are transmitting disease from one host to another. The easiest example of this would be malaria, uh, being in, it's transmitted via mosquitoes. Pathogens that re rely on insect vectors for transmission, it's, this is usually blood that's being extracted by a biting insect. So it's not, not just mosquitoes, it can be ticks, fleas, any of those kinds of things. So for experiment two, we're going to illustrate microbial transmission via direct and indirect contact. For this, we're going to be using glow germ powder. Glow germ is a synthetic, it's basically plastic that has dye in it that glows under UV. 
it's used to simulate microbial transmission because the individual little pieces of powder are the size of individual cells of uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a yeast. But there are no toxins in glow germ. You can handle this stuff with your bare, bare hands, no problem. And what we will do is we'll use the glow germ to uh, see not only like how particles, how easily things are transmitted. So you put some on your hands and you touch your desk, you shake somebody's hand, and you can see how much of that stuff actually gets transferred. And then you can also use it to test to see uh, how well you're washing your hands. So again, I'm kind of beating it in your head. I need to make sure that everybody is using proper hand washing technique. Um, and this is a really, really fun experiment, a really, really fun way to see that. Epidemiology is the study of the occurrence, transmission, frequency, distribution, prevention, and control of disease in human populations. Epidemiologists are essentially disease detectives. Their major concern is developing methods to prevent the spread of pathogens. Some epidemiological terms to know are here. So we've got uh, endemic. Endemic is prevalent in a population or a geographic area at all times. So endemic is the baseline. This is the normal expectancy rate. Endemic diseases are the normal level in a, per, in a population. Okay, now epidemic, this is occurring suddenly in excess of normal expectancy. So an epidemic is an outbreak of a pathogen or a disease that occurs suddenly. So there's a certain level of occurrence and then all of a sudden there's a big spike. Okay, and then pandemic is a epidemic it's a widespread epidemic distributed or occurring widely throughout a region a country a continent or even the globe so a pandemic is an epidemic that's occurring over a wide distance so there's been an outbreak and it's all over the place uh, mechanisms by which pathogens enter the body so these are primary things like laceration scrapes rashes dry skin they can get in through your hair follicles, sweat glands. We, we've already talked about skin and lacerations. Uh, you can also have the bacteria that enters your pores and sweat glands. And you, you guys probably already know, you've heard of acne. Very rarely you have things that can penetrate the skin, like hookworm. Uh, those are pretty nasty. You can also have exposure by breathing, right? You can breathe in an airborne pathogen. Uh, your respiratory system... It has a backup for that though so that's that's why you produce mucus because it helps to trap airborne microorganisms you can ingest contaminated food or drinking water so that would be your food poisoning or your fecal oral transmitted pathogens like cholera uh, touching your nails biting biting your nails touching your mouth chewing on pencils you can ingest a pathogen from food or water but you can also get it just by you know, touching it and then putting it in your mouth. Like, so make sure you're not doing any of nail biting or pencil chewing or any of that kind of stuff while you're in lab. For experiment three, we're going to be honorary epidemiologists. So this experiment is going to involve the entire class working together. And what we're going to do is we're going to have several different petri dishes with candy in them. One of them is going to have this microbe, Micrococcus luteus will be on one of the candies and what I'll do is I'll have I'll have certain volunteers that will uh, swab the candy inoculate their hand and then we'll go around we'll have a couple of rounds of handshakes and we're going to use swab cultures to try to see after once once these plates incubate out we'll try to find where the micrococcus luteus ended up and hopefully trace it back to its source. So again, it's another fun experiment, just kind of getting you guys used to um, working with each other, getting used to working in the lab, learning a little bit about how the media works and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be lots of fun. Make sure you go through these safety guidelines. Just a couple things I'm going to make sure I point out here. Uh, you will be wearing your gloves and glasses, so make sure you have those. Make sure you have your lab coat. If you have any accidents or spills while you're in lab, obviously you want to make sure that you notify an instructor immediately. Any kind of swabs or anything that needs to be disposed of, make sure that you know where those go. And if you don't know, ask your instructor. Leave anything that um, 
needs to be incubated. Make sure it's labeled properly with your section and table and leave those at the end of the bench at the end of class and your instructor will handle those. Okay, so when you come back, so for the lab one results that have to be incubated, so that's your experiment one, experiment three, you're not going to get those results until you come back for lab two. And some things that you want to look for, okay, so in experiment one, you're going to want to look for density of growth pre and post hand washing, so how much bacteria there is. You're going to want to look at different colony types pre and post. So if you have colonies that are present and they look different, maybe they're different sizes or different colors or different shapes, right? That is indicative of them being different species. So you can have more bacteria in general or you can have more species being representative. So those are the things that you're looking for on your plates. And if you have a hypothesis that says after you wash your hands, you think that you would have fewer species, okay, then you can determine if that hypothesis was supported or rejected. So we're going to talk some more about forming and reporting on the results of hypothesis testing when we, when we meet, okay. For experiment three, again, you're going to be looking at, um, you'll be looking for the amylidias in the plates. And depending on where the Inglutius ended up and the order in which we shook hands, hopefully we'll be able to trace back where the Inglutius started and how it got to where it ended up. So we'll work on that together as well. For experiment two, you actually do get those results right away because nothing has to be incubated. So for those, you want to look at um, what areas on your hand after you washed your hands is there still glow germ powder glowing under UV? And then for comparing observed versus expected results, some of you guys are going to expect that you won't see any powder after you wash your hands and find out that, uh, yeah, there's powder under your nails, there's powder in the creases. And so, again, the observations that you're making there, you're just comparing what you thought was going to happen to what actually happened. So it's, supposed to, it's designed to be a fun experiment. Don't stress too hard about it. The colonies of Micrococcus luteus are rather unique. Uh, they're very small and round. They have an elevated margin, so they kind of lift up off the plate. They are completely opaque, so you can't see through them at all. And they have this characteristic yellow color. So most bacteria, you'll see, most bacteria when they're growing on agar are kind of an off-white color, most of them. But every so often you get one that has a bright color. And this guy has a bright yellow color, which is going to help us when we're looking for him. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the video description below for more videos related to these topics. And leave your questions for me in the comments below.